Trevor started a church, actually didn't start a church, took over a church, a little, little church called Norwegian Settlers Church out in the middle of kind of nowhere, I mean, <laughs> basically. And this thing has just grown exponentially. Y'all are building a huge auditorium, aren't you, right now? Big, big several thousand seat auditorium. And, uh, and God is just blessing them immeasurably. But in South Africa, you're surrounded by... I mean, you've got this nice part, and then there's this, this mm. chasm that falls into the abyss and yeah. just need that just breaks your heart. You can't even mm. imagine. Mm. Uh, and, well, tell us about that. Now, uh, Trevor is a visionary, and God really used him uh, to, to birth this thing called Genesis that really addresses this need and, and has raised up, I mean, you've got a team of volunteers that are on Mother Teresa level. I mean, just people that just care for people that just melts me down every time I'm, I think about it. But tell us a little bit about Genesis and how you guys are, are Thanks, meeting Ron. this need. Thank you, Ron. Uh, folks, just really good to be back here. I love coming to your <laughs> church. It's a... Uh, it's, uh, <laughs> Real privilege to, to be with my man, Ron. Yeah. Love this guy. Uh, our, our, the u- uniqueness of our situation is, uh, is, is quite incredible. Ron described it so well. It's a beautiful area on the coastal side, east side of South Africa. Beautiful seas. It's kind of like uh, Hawaii in many ways. Uh, just palm trees and lovely beaches and tourism and, and plenty of affluence and wealth for about a kilometer and snakes. along. And, snakes. and lots of snakes. <laughs> He doesn't like snakes, this guy. So, uh, um, no. and, but, but do not be fooled because uh, a kilometer inland, it's a totally different situation. We're in a, the most impacted HIV infected area in the world. 40 to 50 people, 50% of our people in our area are HIV positive. And when people like that die of this awful disease, not only is it a terrible disease, but the, the tragedy of that which is left behind is hugely significant. There are teenagers running homes, trying to get educated, looking after siblings, and uh, huge challenges, the poverty and the crime, and the dysfunctional community that runs rampant as a result of this thing, the lack of good leadership in our community. It's, 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 a, it's a great place, but there are some really serious humanitarian problems. But we also believe that we have a God who loves us, a God who cares for us, a God who has a plan for us, and a God who loves our community more than even we do, if that is possible. But uh, we have a God who we really believe is the answer to our dilemmas. We don't need more better programs or better preaching or better facilities. We believe, and Ron and I have been chatting now on our concern, we need more of of God and probably a whole lot less of ourselves. (laughs) But but God is, is doing a wonderful work through people like yourselves. You don't realize how much God is doing through you until you come to Africa and you see what Grace Church is involved in. We're out there, but you're here, and uh, we consider you guys partners with us in what we do. And so from the bottom of our African hearts, we, we thank you for that which you have done in resourcing us and visiting us and, and building with us uh, something that we believe significantly right now is making a huge difference. We believe we're scratching the tip of the iceberg. We've got a long way to go, Ron Tucker. A long way to go. But we're making a difference, so we're grateful for just, your just part. The, just the details. You guys have an AIDS hospice so that people can die mm. with dignity. Yeah. You have multiple programs for feeding children, for uh, yeah. working with youth. Mm. I mean, that's one of your big things. Mm. And it's, it's grown beyond your area now to the West Coast. Mm. You're, you're doing it in the West Coast as well. Mm. Mm. Just, just a brief description yeah. of that. Thanks, Ron. Yeah, you know, we, uh, Genesis started with uh, just a concern for, for people dying of HIV and AIDS. We, had, uh, we found these people literally on the beaches, on the streets. They died. Uh, we took them into our homes. We, we had a group of people who were concerned, and we cared for these people. And, and out of that came the birth of our, our care center. It's now a 40-bed, fully equipped care center caring for people dying of HIV and AIDS. But we really believed we didn't want people to get to that stage, so we had to get real and, and get to where the kids are so that they don't end up in the beds dying. And so we have a whole bunch of different youth programs. We run gyms 
bodybuilding gyms, or we have leadership programs for kids, we have community centers all over the place where um, there are creches and clinics and feeding schemes and skills development projects and farming projects and, and all sorts of projects in the endeavor to help the church to become relevant. I think in South Africa, I don't know about here, but in South Africa, the church in the main, probably overgeneralizing, has become irrelevant to the needs of the people. And so our church has tried to get the church outside of the walls of the building to do what we believe the church is called to do. We are salt. And salt cannot sit in the cellar. It needs to get out there and do what it needs to do in a polluted world. So that's really the vision of our little church. And God has blessed us. And again, we thank God for the partnership we have with you guys. Yeah. All right. So I shorted you. I wanted you to hear some of this because you're part of that. And, and many yeah. of our, some of our teams here have, have gone over and helped build uh, for projects and, and do all kinds of things. But we are so blessed to be partners with these guys and to be able to not just light a candle in the darkness, but to, I think you got a bonfire going over there. And brother, we are so grateful to God for the privilege of sharing with you in this. And, and uh, all right, so, so let's pray. Father, just cause your word to burn in our hearts today. God, anoint Trevor this morning to speak to us in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thank, thank you, you man. Guys, thank you again. I hope uh, this little introduction has made you familiar with my accent, although where I come from, you're the ones that talk funny. Uh, but I guess to you, I may sound a little strange, and it will take you a while to get used to, to my, my accent. But uh, Candice, my daughter, has been here with me this trip, so I'm really grateful about that. And we thank you for your fellowship and just your inclusivity inclusiveness of, of us, your love for us has just uh, blown us completely, completely away. You are amazing people. You do need to know that. But I have a, a word that I want to share with you, and uh, I hope that it'll speak to your heart as much as it has to mine in preparing for this particular journey to the States. I'm here for seven weeks. This is my first port of call, so we've got a long journey ahead. But I but I've worked on a theme that I believe is a theme that God would want for me to share with you. And it's based upon a thesis that I would suggest to you may not be perfect, but it's a, it's a starting point. I want to suggest to you that in the church today, there are basically three types of, of people. I want to name them. The first uh, bunch of people that you meet in the church are fans. Fans. They, they kind of like Jesus. They will cheer Jesus on, whoa, go Jesus, and you know, you provide for me Jesus, and I like you Jesus, and, and they, they, they kind of like Jesus, and they will, they will go along with Jesus, they're just part of a crowd, they're like the fans at a pop concert, and they will cheer Jesus on. And then you, 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 then you get out of that, you get followers, you get fans, and then you get followers. These are the people who have who've entered into a much deeper dynamic of their Christian journey. These are the people who are willing to, to suffer a little bit. These are the people who are willing to take on the cause for which Christ has put us on this planet to, to take on. They're the people who, in a sense, have been willing to take up their cross and to follow Him. It's following. You will know you are following Christ and not a fan anymore when you carry a cross. The Bible has speaks specifically in the gospel about two crosses. The first one is the cross that Christ carried on our behalf. That's the cross that we see over here where it, it's a picture of the sacrificial death of Jesus, where by His blood we have been saved, while His blood has become in repentance to a cross, a Savior on a cross who died for us. That's the first cross. It's a wonderful cross for us. The second cross, however, is not that one. The second cross is the one that has your name on it. You see, when you come to this cross in salvation, the moment you receive salvation, many people will run off into the, into the highlight. They become fans and they will cheer for Jesus. But they forget that at the base of that cross, there is a cross that they have to pick up to carry. Jesus said that. I didn't. He said it. In John chapter 6, we have Jesus addressing a crowd of fans, many fans. You see, they liked him because he fed them. The day before, he'd been on the side of the sea, and he had fed them thousands of people with just a few little loaves and a few fish, and, and he, he fed thousands of people, and the people were impressed, and they became very quickly fans of Jesus. And they followed him to the other side of the sea. When Jesus got to the other side of the sea, he said, hey, what are you people doing here? 
They said, oh, no, Jesus, yesterday, you, you know, and Jesus, oh, I know why you're here. You're here because you want more stuff. You went here, you're here because you want me to feed you more and give you more stuff. And Jesus made life rather difficult theologically for them at that particular point. And he began to tell them some of the deep truths. If you look at the parallel accounts in Luke chapter 6, you will see Jesus coming with the words, if you want to follow me, you have to take up your cross daily and follow me. And they didn't like that. Sadly, in the John account, it says this, that after that speech that Jesus made, many left from following Jesus. You see, they were just fans. They were just fans. And when it came to a point where they had to make a sacrifice, they said, hey, I didn't know I was in for that. I thought Jesus was going to heal me. Jesus was going to make me nice. Jesus provide for me. And Jesus, while you're doing that, we, we, we will be friends and I'll cheer you on. But the moment you have to take up your own cross and to follow him, I believe it's true to say today that many choose to leave. Listen, I'm the pastor of a church. And I have seen this dynamic time after time. And I don't want to be like I'm a cynic. I'm not a cynic. I'm not a cynic at all. But I've seen so sadly the dilemma of fans never becoming followers because they never want to pick up that cross that has their name on it. Now, you say, how do I know if I'm a follower? I'll tell you a few things. You will know that you are a follower of Christ and not just a fan of Christ when you're able to stop for a moment and look behind you and see that you've left something behind. Because the Christian life is not a standing still thing. It's a journey. And as you journey along in your Christian journey, you will from time to time be able to stop and look back and say, I have left, for instance, I left at that cross my sin. I have journeyed from there, and I can look back, and I know I am following Jesus because I've left my sin behind. I still am a sinner, but I've left the consequence of my sin at the cross. I've left my baggage at the cross. All that stuff that we need to get over. I don't know about you, but I'm tired of counseling people. You know, they're going to carry this baggage with them. And the church did this, and he did that, and she said this. And, and I'm exhausted with this stuff. And I have to say, when are you going to put it down? Jesus didn't just die for your sin, people. He died for your baggage as well. You don't have to carry that stuff with you. You can leave it at the cross, the same place you left your sin, and you can walk completely free away from that if you want to. But for some sordid, amazing reason, we enjoy the presence of our baggage more than we love the presence of, of Jesus. I don't understand that, but we need to dump that stuff. You will know you are a follower of Christ when you're able to look back and see what you have left behind. In a sense, it's true. Peter, James, and John were fishermen. And Jesus came to them one day and said, hey, guys, do you want to follow me? And they said, hey, hey, Jesus, that'd be really cool. We'd like to do that. And immediately, he says, immediately, they left their nets and they <laughs> followed Jesus. You see, they knew they were following him because within minutes they could see what they'd left behind. They left their nets behind. Matthew was a tax collector. And every day he would sit at his table in the middle of town and he would rip people off and he would take more than what was needed, more than required. He had some for the government, some for him. And he was a wealthy man in monetary terms, but relationally his life was in a mess. And one day Jesus came to him and asked the strangest questions. And I'm sure the disciples must be looking at Jesus and saying, Jesus, where are you going? He says, oh, we need a few more disciples around you. I'm gonna ask Matthew if he wants to follow me. And the disciples said, Jesus, you gotta ask him. But you know what, Jesus, he's, he's a flipping tax collector, man. We don't like to hang out with him. Jesus, we're your disciples. Jesus took no notice. Apparently, Jesus likes tax collectors. And he went along to this rejected man, and he said, hey, Matthew, do you want to follow me? And Matthew, we read, immediately left his table and followed Jesus. I'm sure he was a fan as well. He was once a fan. He'd heard what Jesus had done. He'd seen the miracles, I'm sure. But he moved from fan to follower when he said, I'm willing to leave something behind. Now, I could stop the sermon right there. You'd probably be happy if I would, but I'm not. You know, to look behind you, can you leave? Or can you see, people, what you've left behind? If you have not left your sin at the foot of the cross and the burden that you once carried and the baggage that you, you have, then I wonder if you're really following Jesus. You gotta leave it behind. 
They knew that they were following him, these disciples, because they could see what they had left behind. The second thing you will know, you will know that you're a follower of Christ because not only will you be faithful to him, but you will be fruitful for him. See, fruit is a theme that runs through the scriptures from beginning to end. We read Genesis and we read all about fruitfulness. We read how by God put Adam and Eve in the garden and said, be fruitful and multiply the animals. And he, he saw all of these things and, and he said, be, be fruitful. In Jesus' last hours of his life, in, we call it deathbed talk. And we're going to talk about that. You must come to communion on uh, Wednesday evening. We're going to talk about deathbed talk. Where Jesus with his disciples, he knows the cross is only hours away. And he's walking through a vineyard on the way to Gethsemane. And he sees this vineyard and he stops his disciples. He says, hey, guys, guys, let me tell you something. See this vine over here? I am the vine and you are the branches. He who abides in the vine will bear much fruit. You see, you don't want to mess around on your deathbed talking about stuff that doesn't matter. Jesus was speaking about some of the depths of what it meant to be a follower of Christ. Not only are you to be faithful, but you are as well to be fruitful. Then we move a few years ahead and we see the Apostle Paul writing this in Galatians 5. And he talks about fruit. He says, the fruit of the Spirit, the fruit of the, of the, of the proof of the presence of God in your life can be seen. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, and self-control. Paul says those are the fruit of the Spirit. They're not fruits, plural. They are fruit, singular. When Jesus dwells within you, there has to be fruit. Now, I could spend all day talking to you about all the different aspects of the fruit of the Spirit. I don't want to do that, but I do want to hone in on one. The fruit of the Spirit, according to this, says it is goodness. I want to talk about the fruit today of goodness. I have a couple of statements about goodness that I would like to make to you. And then we'll, we'll see how far we can go with this. First of all, goodness, I have to tell you, is very difficult to define in spiritual terms. You cannot get a dictionary definition to fill exactly what the Bible is talking about when it talks about the fruit of goodness. You see, goodness is not something you so much define as it is something that you see. You can see the fruit of goodness. I know goodness exists because I can see the effect of it. If you came to where I live, you will see the effect of goodness in our care center. You will see people coming to Christ on a daily basis. I have often, and I I'm not even joking about it anymore, said to our church, there are more people in heaven today as a result of our care center than as a result of 130 years of doing church in our church. There are many people today because of the fruit of an outworking of goodness from the people in our church and from people like yourselves that souls are being saved and one for the kingdom. And it's all because goodness does that. You can see the fruit that there is in goodness. Every time I, I, see, I see something like the caregivers in our case that are caring for people under difficult minimum wage circumstances, dead of night, Christmas day, New Year's day, whatever day, these people are there and they're caring and they're cleaning and they're, oh man, I don't want to do that stuff. But I see them doing it. And I see the beauty of the fruit of this thing called goodness. It's a wonderful thing to behold. I'm reminded of goodness every time I read the Bible and I, I read the story of the Good Samaritan, the Good Samaritan. And the fruit of his goodness was seen in this man. He didn't owe anything to this man. He probably didn't even like this man in the gutter. And yet goodness got him down into the gutter to give that man a better condition. You see, goodness is evident, and you can see the fruit of it, and you can see the evidence that there is goodness because you can see the evidence. It's a, it's a beautiful thing. And every time I read the Bible and I see, I, I read the story of David and Mephibosheth, man, I'm reminded of goodness. Here's David the king, Mephibosheth a nobody. He should have been killed when David took over as king. And Mephibosheth is now a cripple. And David brings him in to the palace. And Mephibosheth thinks he's going to die. 
And David said, no, you're not going to die. You're going to sit next to me here at the table at my right hand. And everything that your uncle Saul had, I'm going to give to you. And you're going to be, you're going to rule and you're going to reign with me. And he says, but I'm a cripple and I'm a reject and I'm a nobody. And David said, well, I like cripples and I like nobodies. And you're going to sit right here next to me at the place of highest authority. And every time I read that story, I am reminded of what goodness looks like. Every time I hear a testimony of someone having come to Christ, I'm reminded of what goodness looks like. I would remind you of what goodness looks like even today. Behind these curtains here, there are people who serve you at the door stewards, in the kids' church, in the youth groups. There are people who volunteer to serve you, and I see the fruit of their goodness in your lives and in your church. Thank God for people like that. Goodness is something you probably see every day. Goodness might be something that you yourself have been a recipient of. But for one thing is for sure, you will know it exists because you'll recognize it when you see it. That's the first thing about goodness. The second thing about goodness is similar to the first one, but different. That goodness has lost, as a word or a concept, good has lost its sense of wonder. It's lost its sense of wonder. We now have sort of a, a scale of excellence that begins with good. It goes from good to better to best. And good is like the baseline if you want to excel towards excellence. Jesus never saw it like that. We have books written, and I don't want to knock them because I use them. We talk about going from good to great. I don't ever hear Jesus ever telling anybody to strive for greatness. Never. Jesus elevated goodness. If you know what goodness means, Jesus said good is good enough. And yet in our culture, we think good is a baseline towards greatness. In the parable that Jesus told of, the, of the, 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 the talents, and this king went away and he gave talents to the people who worked for him. He said, guys, I'm going to be coming back. I want to see what you do with what I have given you. To one he gave five. When he came back, he had five more. What did the king say? Well done, what? Great and faithful servant? No, no, no. What do you say? Well done, good. doesn't get better than good and faithful servant. The one who had nothing was cast into outer darkness. People, we will stand before God one day. This is just telling us what it's about. It's prophetic. That every one of us will stand before God one day to give an account, to say, well, what have you done? God says, what have you done with what I gave you? How cool would it be if he were to say the same thing to us? Well done, good and faithful servant. You see, good has taken a bad rap. And I believe it's got a bit of a raw deal. We talk about kids at school who are goody goodies. You know, it's a derogatory term. Goody goody. No, not good. Good is what Jesus said is great. And we need to understand that. Parents always say to the kids before they go out, what do you say to your kids before you leave the house? Be good. That means just don't do anything bad. That's what it really means. And when Jesus says be good, he's not saying just don't do anything that's bad. He has, a, he has a great plan for this thing called good. And it is a far more than just not being bad. And so we need to understand when Jesus says good, it's like the top echelon of goodness that is a fruit that should come from our, our lives. We often pray, Lord, help me to be good. Help me to be good. My parents used to pray that for me because I, they didn't think I could do it on my own. Lord, help him. Help Trevor to be good. Uh, it didn't work. It really didn't. But, but what they were thinking was help Trevor to be nice. You know, help Trevor to be harmless. Help him, help him to be, you know, kind of like a neutral. Don't let him make a big stand or embarrass us on anything. And we tend to sort of think that being good just means being nice and neutral, sit on the fence, don't offend anybody. When I read the Bible, I see a whole bunch of people who were good doing the opposite of that. I think of Nathan. When Nathan came to David after David had messed up with Bathsheba. And David told him, Nathan told him the story. And David fell from his throne and he repented. And I'm pretty sure that God in heaven said, hey, angels, check what Nathan's just said. Now that, guys, is good. It was confrontational. It was truthful. It was in the face. And God would have put that in the category of being very, very good. I think good has taken a bad rap and it has lost its sense of, of wonder. When we look at good, we have to look at creation. Way back in the Garden of, of, of Eden, or prior to that even, and God creating so beautifully out of the word of his mouth, he spoke it, and there was light. 
and there was a sun, there was a moon, and God stood back, and what did He say? He said, hey, guys, that's good. Why was it good? Was it good because it looked nice? No, no, not at all. It was good because it served its purpose. The only reason the sun was declared good was because it shone, and it did what God had purposed for it to do. You don't look good by just sitting, singing songs and doing religious stuff. But when your heart is broken by the things that break the heart of Jesus, and you take up that cross, which is just a small version of His, and you carry the cross that Jesus bore for mankind, and you partner with Jesus in carrying your cross, God says, man, that is good. That is really good. Now, I just think sometimes as I read the Bible and I see the confrontationalness of goodness, I, I look at Nehemiah, and Nehemiah was a wonderful man, deep burden, wanted to carry his cross, went back to Jerusalem, I'm sure you know the story, man, and he went back to Jerusalem and he called a meeting with all the people and he gave them a hard time. He said, why are you like this? Why are the walls down? You have everything you need to build the walls. And in a confrontational way, God would have looked at him and said, angels, check out Nehemiah. That is good. He wasn't nebulous. He wasn't pathetic. He wasn't sitting on the fence. He was not neutral. He wasn't nice even. God's not paid him to be nice. God paid him to be truth truthful. And God said, therein lies something that is really good. When Jesus threw the money changers out of the temple, God said, that's good. When Peter walked on water and then fell, God would have said, angels, that's good. When Jesus said to the man with the withered arm, put out your arm, and he did, God would have said, check that, guys, that's good. That's good. And when we take these steps of faith, and when we do what Peter did, and, and when, when Jesus saw that woman who came with a little mite, a couple of cents, and she embarrassedly put it into the offering, it was all she had. And Jesus said to the disciples, guys, did you see that? <laughs> they said, we saw that, man. She put a mite in there. What use is that, man? And then Jesus said, wow, that's incredible. That is really good. That is really good. The disciples don't understand the truth of what goodness is really is. It's a great example of goodness. In Acts chapter 11, it's written of a man called Barnabas, verse 24 of Acts 11. It's beautiful. simply says this about Barnabas. Barnabas was a good man. Go and read the story of Barnabas. Glory in his goodness to people, his generosity, his kindness, for his willingness to walk alongside people who'd been rejected by the apostle Paul even. Barnabas was a good man. Doesn't get better than that. Do not think for a minute, people, that greatness is where we should be going towards. Not at all, man. Good is good enough if you understand what good really means. Let me make another statement with regard to goodness. And that statement simply says this, that although we can see goodness, there is only one who is truly good, and you know who that is. That is God. And in the context of God's goodness, all your goodness, your man-made goodness, is as what? Filthy, ah, filthy rags. So you cannot come with your little man-made little bit of goodness and think that you're going to impress God, who is the epitome of that which is good. Your goodness will blow up in a, in a flame. Your goodness will mean nothing. Just think of Isaiah. Isaiah came to church one day, as he always did, came to the temple, walked in, and he saw God as he had never seen him before. He thought this would be just a normal day of church. Isaiah walks in, and he says, oh, my word. Isaiah chapter 6. I saw the Lord. He was high. He was lifted up, and his train filled the temple. And the angels, they were crying, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. If Isaiah was standing here today, you could interview him, say, Hey, Isaiah, what did you do then? <laughs> he said, Man, I thought I could offer God my goodness. You know, I'm a good guy. I'm a nice guy. I'm a neutral guy. I'm trying to be a decent prophet, but, but in the context of God's goodness and His holiness, I found myself on the floor, and all my goodness was just gone because it's worth nothing. You see, 
people who try and be good without Jesus just can't pull it off. And it means nothing. So when Isaiah came in that day, he wasn't coming with his own. He came with his own goodness and left being mesmerized with God. Let me tell you how good God is. The scripture tells us clearly many times. Read the Psalms if you want to hear about the goodness of God. It says this, Psalm 34 verse 8, taste and see that the Lord is what? Is good. You can't talk in church. It's okay. Taste and see that the Lord is? Is good. For the Lord is good and His mercy is everlasting. Good and upright is the Lord. Psalm 25 verse 8, all His ways are loving and and faithful. Scripture is very clear that there is no one really good other than God. Do you remember the rich young ruler who came to Jesus and he said, good teacher. And Jesus said, why do you call me good? There is only one who is good and that is God. And then this young ruler began to tell Jesus how good he was. The young ruler began to say, Jesus, keep the commandments doing the best I can. And Jesus said, yeah, you've done, you've done, yeah, you're my young man, you've done pretty well. You've done pretty well. But young man, this one thing, I hate those words. You know, I use them a lot as a parent. When my kids come and they, they lay it on me, they want stuff, you know, and they're very articulate and very manipulative, and they want stuff. And it looks like I'm going along with them. And then I say, but guys, just one thing. Just, just, just one thing. I'm the boss. I'm the boss here. Just what, just what, and that kills that entire argument. You know, it's beautiful. You must try it. This one thing, I pay the bills around here. This one thing, this is our house. You know, this one thing changes everything. And it changed everything for that good, apparently good young man who came to Jesus in his own goodness and left seriously disappointed because of that one thing. People who try and do good or be good without Jesus, I have to tell you, just can't pull it off. But this I do know, and at this I'm going to sort of close down now. We sang some beautiful songs today, I don't know if you noticed, about the presence of God. You hear about that? Yeah, oh man, Caleb, your, your, your people are amazing. And they hit the nail, the sort of nail right on the head. It's all a, the presence of God, people, listen carefully, makes all the difference. Because in the presence of God, there is goodness. And let me tell you from my experience, people change in the environment of goodness. People do not change in the environment of the law. That's why the law failed. The law is good, and it's there to protect us and to teach us what God does and does not like. The law is not bad. I'm not nullifying the law, but I'm saying the law never changes anything. All the law will do is add guilt and add shame and add helplessness because I can't fulfill it perfectly. Just adds that to you. But in the context of God's goodness, I read the Bible and I see people changing. I see that woman who was caught in adultery, thrown at the feet of Jesus, and said they'd judge her according to what? The law. And Jesus knew the law's not going to change this woman, but his goodness would. And so when he knelt down next to this, this woman in her disgrace and in her embarrassment and in her sin, you know, and Jesus said, you know what, I know the Lord's not going to do much for you, baby. The Lord's not going to change you. But in the context of his goodness, that woman left a changed person. You see, people change in the context and in the presence of, of goodness. I think of, of Matthew, what we spoke about just now. His life was changed. Think of Nicodemus. His life was changed because he changed, not because of somebody bigger than him or the law was laid on him. He changed in the context and in the environment of goodness. As I said, I see this at home. Your goodness to us, our goodness to them, and lives, people, are being changed because of the goodness of God. People change in the presence of goodness. That, that thief that hung next to Jesus on that cross that day that Jesus died, in a flash and a blue, in an instant and a click of a finger, his life changed. The other guy didn't, but the one guy did. How, why did it change? 
He was declaring that he was there because of the law. He says, I am guilty. I am getting, and so are you, he says to the other thief. He says, so are you getting what we deserve. The law has judged us. We're getting what we want. But Jesus said, hey, how about some goodness around this place? And one man's life was changed because of the presence of the goodness of, of Jesus. Hey, it's incredible, man. It's amazing. I started off saying to you just now that in your, <clears throat> in your spiritual journey, you need to look back from time to time and see what you've left behind. I trust that you have left your sin and your guilt and your baggage at the foot of a cross and that you've seen the cross that has your name on it and you've been courageous enough to pick that thing up and move from being a fan to a follower of Christ. You'll know you're a follower because you carry a cross. You'll know you're a follower because you can look back and see where you've left the junk behind. And you'll know you're a follower because there'll be evidence of goodness in your life. In Psalm 23, at the very end, it says this, David says this, and, and goodness and mercy will what? Follow me, how long? All the days of my life. He's talking about himself here. He's saying, you know, everywhere I go, I look around and because I love God and because I'm a man after his own heart and I desire to be a good king and, you know, I, I, I ask God to help me and everything. And then I look back, he says, and goodness me. You know what's happening here? I see goodness and mercy following me everywhere I go. I go here, I look behind, I see goodness and mercy. I go there, I see goodness and mercy. I just see goodness and mercy following me. All the days of my life. Let me ask you, what is following you through your life? I don't know you. I don't know you. And you don't know me. But I do know this, that I see many people who leave a devastating trail of dysfunctionality behind them. I see people, there's no goodness and mercy following them. There's just broken relationships and lies and miscommunications and wrong motives and wrong attitudes and, and, and play acting. I see that behind a whole bunch. And I don't want to sound judgmental, but you see it the same as I. What's following you? If you're a follower of Christ, not a fan. Fans leave junk behind them. But in the wake of God's goodness, being received by you, you will automatically, people, listen carefully. Everybody look at me. You will leave a trail of goodness and mercy behind you all the days of your life. That's God's plan for you. It's God's plan for your church. And we are beneficiaries over in South Africa of the goodness of your church I trust that you, as members and, and, and participators here at Grace Church, will have the truth being said of your own life as well, that goodness and mercy will follow you all the days of your life. You'll be able to know. Let, let me end with a practical note here. I want you just to think back this last year. Just, just in your mind's eye, just close your eyes, think about it. Are there maybe five people, just five, not allowed to be family members, just five people who have benefited from your goodness and are there in the wake and the trail of your goodness and mercy being left behind you. Can you just name five people who are in a better position today because of your goodness and your mercy? You're allowed to do this. In fact, we have to do it because people tend to think that they're better than they are. And I don't want to lay guilt on you, but I do want you to be real and ask yourself, what am I leaving behind me? Is there journey, is there, is there dysfunction and broken relationship, junk, or am I leaving behind me a trail of goodness and mercy that other people are blessed because I've been there ahead of them? Oh, man, we should start an epidemic of goodness and mercy. That would be really cool. And you'll see goodness and mercy, they go hand in hand. That would be amazing if we could do that. I have one last word. We start off by saying this. There's three types of people. I've told you about two. We've talked about fans, we've spoken about followers, now I just want to close by talking about fools. Now, I don't know whether there are any here today, <laughs> because you know what a fool is. A fool is someone who has said in his heart, there is no God. A fool is somebody who plays the fool with spiritual things, and they think that this church thing or this spiritual thing is just some kind of game that we play. That's foolish behavior. You don't want to do that. That's foolish. I think of fools in the context of what Jesus told in that parable of the rich farmer 
who had a great harvest that year. He broke down his barns, built bigger barns. And he says, man, this, now I can sit back, eat, drink, and be merry. And that night, the angel of death visited him and said, man, you're a fool. Tonight, your soul will be required of you. I hope there's none like that here today. But here's the good news, if you are. If you have said in your heart that there is no God, maybe you've been playing games with spiritual things. I have to tell you that there is a God who loves you deeply, deeply loves you. doesn't want to mock you. doesn't want to lay more guilt on you. But it, does, it wants you to come to the cross. Stop your foolish behavior. Commit your life to following Him. It is the greatest thing you could ever do. Don't just stop there. Because when you've been there to the cross and received the salvation of Jesus as a result of that cross, there is a cross lying around that cross with your name on it. Fans don't carry crosses. Followers do. And your cross will just simply be a smaller version of the burden that Jesus bears for mankind and for humanity. Are you carrying that cross? I really hope so. If not, it's okay to go back. I don't know, mind if you've been a Christian for 20, 40 years, it doesn't matter. You can still go back and find your cross that has been sitting there waiting for you to pick it up. I trust you will do that today. Let's pray. God, we declare unashamedly today and amazingly that you, you're a good God. You're not nebulous. You know, some nice little God that we can bring out on a Sunday and sing a few songs about. You are a good God who's not afraid to confront us with the truth. God, I pray today for these good people here. God, I pray, show them your goodness. Show them your grace and your mercy because goodness and mercy just seem to go hand in hand. Why don't you show that to us today as we close our service. And if there are any, Lord, who have acted foolishly, maybe rejected you, maybe belittled the Christian journey, oh God, graciously reveal your goodness to them today. For those of us, Lord, who have been fans, we kind of get a kick out of Jesus. And we get what we can from you, and then when we're disappointed by you, we walk away like those people in John chapter 6 did. That makes you sad. And we don't want to sadden your heart anymore than it already is. Pray today that there would be people here who would maybe have to take a journey back to the cross where they received their salvation to pick up that cross that they have left behind. It has their name on it. And you have clearly said to us that followers carry crosses where we share your burden for mankind and your desire to see all humanity saved. For the purpose of heaven and your kingdom here on earth. Thank you that you are good.